Welcome to an episode of Find Your Voice, a movement led by yours truly, Aaron Dew, a guy who has overcome crippling anxiety, adversity, and difficulty like so many of you in life, whose main goal now is to help you combat your excuses, take control of your life, write your own story, and most importantly, find your voice. So now, without further ado, I welcome the host of the show himself, Mr. Aaron Dew. What's going on, people? Yes, that is correct. My name is Aaron, and I am the host of the show. So I'm extremely excited today because my guest is somebody who's not only got an incredible story that is riddled with ups and downs and trials and tribulations, but he's also someone I consider a friend. Alongside that, he's also a loving father to two beautiful girls, He's a loving husband and he's a very successful property investor. So I think it's more important we speak to him rather than listening to myself because some of the stuff he's going to say is really going to blow your mind. So without further ado, let's get this interview on the way. Good morning, Jin. So uh, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. How about yourself? Uh, Not too bad, thank you. Just a little bit of a cold, which hopefully doesn't affect the podcast too much. So I just want to start firstly by saying thank you for taking time out of your day to share your story. I'm very confident it's going to obviously inspire other people knowing who you are as a person. So I think it's important for the listeners to basically get to know you. So if you could just please explain how you've progressed through life and ended up where you are currently. Okay, so without sounding like the, the little kid on Goonies and then going through <laughs> my whole story in too much detail, mm-hmm. I'll give you a bit of a summary. So okay. uh, a bit about me. Uh, so my first memories of a child was probably with my older sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was about three years older than me. And uh, she used to kind of always be up to mischief and I was I was a little sidekick. Uh, I can tell you one of the stories. Uh, so one of the times she dared me to... Uh, throw a stick at a wasp's nest <laughs> and right. me crazily used to do everything she told me to do mm-hmm. <laughs> it seems like a good idea why not <laughs> yeah so i did that I threw, a wasp, threw a stick at a wasp's nest and uh, had a swarm of wasps chasing me Ouch. in the garden uh it didn't end well for me as you can imagine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah i you know i used to i used to just follow her around everywhere and I, I was always you know really proud of her mm-hmm. um so she's you know she was kind of a big inspiration to me uh, okay. growing up. Um, and then kind of to summarise the kind of years after that, I could probably summarise them as the, I went, kind of experienced a lot of grief. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to deal with uh, my dad, who was an alcoholic, uh, seen a lot of violence and experienced a lot of loneliness as a child. Uh, so kind of going into the grief part, uh, I first experienced grief uh, when I was around 10 years old. So my dad's younger brother my uncle uh, he used to live with us for a while mm-hmm. and um so i was very close to him and kind of in ways i saw him as my second dad really mm-hmm. and around christmas eve well, it was on christmas eve he went out for a, a works party with a few of his friends and uh there was all over the they all got quite drunk and the driver was over the limit uh and on the way home uh, they started getting chased by police officers uh and the, t- the driver decided to, to try to get away, and he ended up smashing the car into a brick wall. Mm. Uh, my uncle was at the back uh, in the middle seat without a seatbelt on, so it was probably the worst place you could be. Mm. Uh, and a head-on crash, and he basically just went straight, uh, straight, straight to the front, and died on scene. Uh, so he, he was the only, the only person in the car to to die, uh, and it was just because he was in the wrong place in the car, really. Sorry to interrupt. How old is you at this time? Yeah, so I was about 10 years old at the time. Okay. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's kind of a difficult time for me. Uh, I think as, as people, I think we, hard, we find it hard to deal with grief. Mm-hmm. And I think that's especially within the Indian community. So I think nobody ever spoke to me about it. Uh, and it was just kind of, is there happening in the background? And I could see the pain uh, in my dad and my family and stuff like that. But nobody ever came and asked us how we felt as children. Uh, and I, saw, I don't think I ever dealt with it properly until, a few, until like recently, really, where I kind of started to think about it a bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was, that was kind of the, the beginning of, you know, me, me experiencing grief and what grief was like. Uh, and then from there, I think my dad, who already kind of had a drink problem at the time, um, kind of just went off the rails. Um, so he, didn't, he just didn't know how to handle it. Uh, and, well, his way of handling it was just turning to drink. 
and with that he started to become quite violent and we experienced a lot of violence in the household on a kind of on like your daily weekly basis basically um so i was still, I was still quite young then um, and i felt it was my role to protect my family um, so i used to try to get my sisters upstairs and out the way when the was in violence was coming and then I'd, I'd come back downstairs myself and then try to stop my dad but you know there's not much i could do uh, being so young uh, and that kind of started affecting me in a, in a quite negative way. Uh, it just made me feel worthless. Uh, didn't, I felt like I wasn't a man. I was like I wasn't able to protect my family, um, and I was really hard on myself. Um, so I kind of that continued uh, into my teenage years, basically. And um, as I got older, I got bigger, but I was still I was still really afraid of my dad. Because uh, it kind of embedded embedded into me at that time, uh, you know. If he just raised his voice, I'd, I'd get really nervous and scared, um, and that made me felt felt like even worse as a person. Um, and and the violence continued, and you know, and I just felt like I couldn't do anything. So for me, I I started I, I was around about 15 years old. I turned to boxing. Okay. And I started I started getting into boxing. It helped me in many many ways. It just helped me control that aggression that was inside of me. Mm-hmm and you know the anger uh so yeah it kind of helped me in a lot of ways uh but also i started getting the reputation at school as the hard man and you know every time there was any trouble in school i would say oh gin gin will sort it gin will sort it and i ended up getting in a lot of fights at school um and so i was always quite lonely in primary school i didn't have any many friends uh, i didn't have any you know just to walk around on myself i didn't have a, kind of didn't have a single friend until i was about 10 years old mm. Uh, and then when I got to secondary school, you know, I started making a few friends, but not many. Uh, but then it, always, it was always for the, the wrong reasons. I kind of, I got known as either the tough guy who get into fights, or then I started drinking myself, uh, which I always, I used to hate alcohol, because I've seen it as what, what caused my dad problems. Of course. Yeah. I lost my uncle through alcohol, alcohol related. But I think there's one time I just, I just started drinking with some friends. They started a lot more, a lot earlier than me. And I just, I, I didn't really have, an, I couldn't really fit in the crowd. Uh, they still did their own thing. And I went out with them one time and said, come on, now we drink with us, Gene. And I ended up drinking with them. Uh, I was still quite young myself then. And I kind of got that reputation then as, you know, he's a good laugh when he has a drink. And he's, he's you know, he gets it, he's, a good, he's, a good, he's good at fighting. So if, if, if anyone's got any trouble, he'll sort it. And that's not the person I wanted to be inside, but that's the person I became. And uh, that continued really for many years. And then... From there, I kind of, I went to, when I finished school, I went to university, and I kept that persona. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Gene was the, the, the fun, crazy fun guy that you could have a good laugh with when he's had a few drinks, and he's, you know, he's a bit of a tough nut. Mm-hmm. And, you know, inside, I always felt that that's not me. I'm just, I'm just this you know, other person, and that's the person that people like. They don't like, if, if I really show who I was myself, people wouldn't like that. I wouldn't be that. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be that fun person that everybody enjoys. So I became somebody else, basically. That's a very interesting point. I think you just made there, your dad and the violence in the house, and I suppose you somehow, indirectly, almost became that kind of person, i.e., the hard man, for example. Yeah. But I think it takes amazing awareness, uh, which you've just mentioned a couple of seconds ago, that you quickly realise that okay, although I'm getting plaudits and people are kind of now coming to me and and they're finding my company great, for example, but this isn't the kind of person I want to be known as. And I think that takes a lot of awareness because people will relate to this. We sometimes pigeonhole ourselves into situations or groups just because we fit in by being a particular person. But what I always want to try and do is tell people, don't try and fit into a crowd by being somebody you're not. I just wanted to point that out just for the listeners because I think it's important that you were able to recognise that, hold on a minute, this isn't Jin Atwell. This is a, an episode or should we call it a chapter of your life, but this isn't the person that you are. It's certainly not the person that I know today. Yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I think that's exactly it. But I did realise, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take action to change. I was very quickly, to be honest. I was, I was, I, I, it took me a long, long time. So you know, after finishing university, I was still, you know, I still that reputation. I was still that kind of person. And then I started my job, and you know I started. I started. I got my first job working for a big energy company. Uh, in there, I was still not happy. You know, I started off doing a job I didn't really want to do, just to get my foot in the door. Uh, a degree in business studies, what I did, didn't really seem to help me, and get get the the kind of income that I wanted. So I started off stapling bills, 
uh, for a big energy company. You know, I haven't been to university and done everything else. I, you know, I was there stapling bills, uh, you know, five days a week. And I kind of, that annoyed me and I, and I got my head down and I started, you know, right, Jin, you, you can't do this. You need, to, you need to, you know, work your way up in the company. So I got my head down and I moved from that, that position all the way up until a senior position within the company within 10 years, oh, wow. looking at the business strategy. So my, ro- my role at, uh, towards the end of my, of my career at Empower uh, was looking at the business strategy and how we can use smart metering and smart data to launch new products into the market. So it's a good it's a good job, and I'd you know I'd worked my way up from stapling bills to that. It was a massive achievement, but even through then I wasn't happy. I was like you know I, I'm still not me. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I should you know I, I'm not I'm not the version of what I want to be of myself. But I don't know who the version I want to be of myself it should be and what that should look like. Uh, I always had a dream of getting into property, and it's something I, I did as I did with my mom a few times when we were younger. Uh, we didn't really make much money on it because we didn't really know what we were doing. We, we all respect properties. We did, we, you know, we turned them into amazing homes, but didn't really think about in terms of the cash flow and and how much we'd make from that property. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it, but it's always there in the back of my mind because like not not having a a home to feel home as a young as a, as a child. Mm-hmm. You know, I never felt like home was home. I always had this vision that I'd one day create am- amazing homes. For people to live in, uh, so it was always my, always my vision and always something I said to my wife. And you know, when I got married, I said, I said, I want to get into property. I want to get property. I used to say it all the time. She probably got fed up of me here, fed up <laughs> of me, fear of me saying it. To be honest, and then the other thing I used to say, oh, I'm one day I'm going to go uh, to a third world country and I'm going to build a well, uh, and I'm going to build a school for children. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's just dreams, and I was doing nothing. That would ever get me there. Uh, my dreams didn't have a fighting chance of ever becoming reality because I, was, I wasn't doing anything to, to get there. Right. Uh, so I was just, I was just talking about them, and then I kept. So by doing that, as time goes by and you start talking about these dreams and they're not happening, you lose. You, the dreams start fading, and you start losing faith, and you, you, you're just falling into a routine of work and doing things that you don't want to do, and life's passing you by, and. You know, you, you you kind of start losing a lot of faith, and, you, and as your dreams fade, you you start fading as a person. So I've, I've kind of always said, one day when I get made redundant, I'll I'll start doing all this. I'll get made redundant from a company one day, and I'll start using that money to do all this stuff. And you know, when you focus on something, as you know, I say, say, if you focus on something, it becomes reality. Yeah. I I think that is true because I focused on becoming redundant. I focused on the right wrong things in certain ways. I focused on made redundant and I got made redundant. <laughs> Which is an unusual thing for anyone to kind of focus on, I suppose. Yeah, and it, it, I focused on that because I thought I'd get a lump sum of money and from that lump sum of money, then I could start doing what I wanted to do. Okay. And then, I, like, like, I was, like I was speaking to one of my friends when I was, um, I hadn't seen him for about 20 years and, and, and he said, oh, so you brought a BMW in the end? I said, yeah. And he goes, I go, why? Why do you say that? And he goes, as a child, you used to always say, I'm going to get a BMW. Right. And I kind of laughed at him and said, oh, I wish I said I was going to buy a Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> as a child, because then I'd have a Lamborghini. But yeah, so I think being made redundant kind of was a, the start of my, my new life, really. Um, uh, kind of, well, I kind of missed part bit of my life, actually. Uh, just, as, just as I finished university, um, uh, I just finished and... Uh, I got news that my my dad had fallen over and uh, bumped his head. It's around about the same time as my, my sister just got married. Uh, she had she had got off on a honeymoon. She was on her honeymoon, and then and then we got a call saying from the hospital saying you you know your dad's in hospital. He's, he's bumped his head, um, and we went and went and visited him in hospital. Uh, and when I saw him there, I was like really angry at him. And I saw him, you know, part of me wanted to give him a hug and say you know. Because he just, he's, you know, he didn't look. He had a big, uh, a lot of bruising on his face. And the, the, but the other part of me is like, what are you doing to yourself? What, what, you know, take control of your life. Of course. And that, and that came out. I just said to him, like, you know, I'm ashamed of you. You know, you need to, you need to sort yourself out. And then I just turned, turned away and walked out of the hospital. And that turned out to be the last words I ever said to my dad. Uh, we got a call that night saying that he dropped, fell over in hospital again. And it 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 is in a coma basically, uh, and this basically just messed messed me up totally uh, for years. You know, not not just short term. It just played on my mind, and and I started drinking a lot more, 
And every time I drank, I used to like cry with friends and say, look, you know, this is my last word I said to my dad. This is my last word I said to my dad. And they're like, you know, it's not your fault. You know, and I just, I just wouldn't go away. And, and it wouldn't go away. And like I said, I went into, went into my work, went to my company, and, just, and, I, and I was doing all this stuff, but it never, it always been in the back of my mind. And then being made redundant, uh, kind of that, like I said, that was the start to my, my new life. And I, I got made redundant in January 2017. So I'm not talking long ago. But at that, that point, I, I kind of was kind of introduced to the property world. Yeah. But uh, I went on a property course, but it wasn't the property world as such. I got introduced. But when you go on these property courses, you start, you got, you, you basically go in a room full of people that's, that haven't lost faith. You know, they're still dreaming mm-hmm. and they're still trying to action that dream. I mean, you surround yourself with those people, you start believing again, and you all start believing again. And that changed me totally. I started believing my dreams again, but it wasn't just that. They they told me to read books, right? And I thought, okay, what what books? They said I got go and read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Start yourself off. So I did that, and I thought, oh, okay, this this is this is good. I enjoyed reading that book, and from then I just started reading self development books all the time, and I'd never done anything like that in my life, and this only helped me understand me who I was, why I felt, why I did. You know, I I thought I, thought I began to realise there's a book out there for every single thing in your life Absolutely. to help you understand things, and so I started reading and reading a lot of books, um, and they've had a massive impact on me. It's, it's quite a strange thing because every time I pick up a book and read it, I somehow apply that into my life, and it makes a massive difference. So, you know, the first book was like yeah, Rich Dad Poor Dad, which helped me the property business, but then I read stuff like uh, the Five Second Rule, which talked tell Mel me Roberts. about you know. Yeah, a, a massive. That's had a massive impact on my book and on my life, really. Uh, uh, the, the slight edge was the next one yeah, I read actually, and book. that kind of taught me about you know. I it taught me that I keep saying that I'm going to have this much. I'm going to go and build a well. I'm going to go and do something to that because it's not like that. That things don't happen like that. You Gene, have to start off by doing a little bit at each time and building yourself up to that. I think what you just said there is a very good point, and I think this is where a lot of people, they probably get the wrong message because a lot of people read The Secret or they hear about The Secret and they think just wishful thinking alone, I wish I could win the lottery, for example, or I wish I get a Lamborghini, for example, and just by solely wishing that their dreams come true. But I think you obviously are explaining now, you've realised that, that it takes a little bit more than that. It takes the whole mindset, the whole self-love, the self-worth and stuff, which you spoke about earlier in relation to how you yeah. felt. And I think more important than that is action. And I know you, and I think we met around the same time you were redundant and yeah. you openly admitted that there was times you weren't taking action. And I think yeah. you're very honest yeah. in that. But now I, I see you and I think people that see you on Facebook who are following your journey are seeing you. I think you've adopted, is it a miracle morning? Which I think is probably pre- prevalent yeah. to your story. But there's action being taken there now. Now it's not just like fluffy action. Like I'd certainly urge people to just head over to your Facebook. There's like It's almost like a daily thing that you're doing and you're being accountable I know knowing you, it's more for yourself. But at the same time, people are seeing that and people are thinking, hold on a minute, this guy's out there and now he's actually taking action. His world started to change. Maybe I should implement it. And I know there's a couple of other friends who uh, I've spoken to who are actually adopting the same thing. So fair play to you for that, mate. Yeah, I think, I think like I say, to me, reading books has been a massive thing for me. It's changed, it's changed my life. Meeting people that haven't lost, in, lost faith in their dreams is one big thing. Mm. And then the other thing is just reading books and, and reading, you know, if you ever got a problem, find a book for it. And then no, that's, that's what I've, I've found. Uh, like I said, after, like I said, you talk about Miracle Morning, that's something I started as well, uh, which has had a massive impact on me. So that's basically just having a morning routine, uh, spending time on yourself. So for me, it's always about doing stuff for other people, you know, making other people happy, mm-hmm. uh, wishing, if, you know, trying to do every, everybody, trying to control everybody's life and making sure everybody gets on, everybody's happy. And I, I, I struck, when I struggled to do that, I used to feel hard on myself. But then I realised that you can't control everybody else's life. You have to. You, the only thing you really have control of is yourself. yourself. And, yeah, and if you don't spend time on yourself, then and trying to give yourself to everybody, spread yourself out, you'll never help anybody. Mm-hmm. Start helping yourself, become a stronger person, and then once you're in that position, then you can start helping other people. And I think that's what I realised from Miracle Morning. I started spending time on myself, reading. You know, uh, I'd go out for a, a run come back from my run, uh, do affirmations, meditation, you know, things I found hard mm. to begin with. I thought, I thought it was a bit fluffy, but now I love it, you know, I just do it naturally. 
uh, I do, you know, meditation, I, put, I, can't, I don't want to sit there and sit in silence for five minutes. I can't do that because I found it hard having my own time. I think I've never done it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now I just, it's something I, just, I have to do. It's, it's, like a, it's like medication for me in a way. If I don't take my medication daily, I'd be start be getting depressed again. And I think, if you wouldn't mind just elaborating on that actually, because I'm a big believer that we are a result of not only our thoughts and what we tell ourselves, but our daily habits. And, and I've seen your world transform, which is fantastic to see uh, as a friend, so much since you've adopted these habits. So if, if for the listeners, uh, if you could just kind of explain your daily routine. So I know you're up very early. You're actually up earlier than me, uh, one of the very few. So uh, kudos to that. But if you could just explain from the moment you wake up, just very quickly, kind of like hour by hour, what you kind of do. And maybe people who have got a similar situation to yourselves can kind of get their medication fix and uh, yep. get their daily routine similar to yourself okay so for, for me it's waking up at 5 a.m uh, most days i don't always do that I don't, i'm not as hard on myself as i was always when i began now if, if, if i'm having a later night i'll make sure i still get my sleep and wake up a bit later but most most days i'll wake up at 5 a.m uh, as soon as i wake up uh brush my teeth go downstairs have a glass of water and then i'll just i'll just get out of the house as fast as i can get out do a 5k run uh, during that run, I'll sometimes listen to an audio book, or sometimes it'll just be silence in my own thoughts, uh, and I'll just think about things, and and then think about life, think about ideas, and then by the time I get back, I'm quite fresh. You now the, the the cold air outside, especially at, at the moment, hits your face and it just wakes you up. And then by the time I get home, then I'll I will go straight into meditation. I'll meditate for five minutes, and from that I'll go and do look at my goals which I've got on the wall. Do, and then I'll do some affirmations. I'll talk to myself about what my purpose in life is and, and what I want to achieve uh, that's bigger than me. And then I'll write down three things that I'm grateful for. And then if I haven't done an audio book while I've run, I'll, I'll do my audio book at the end. And then by then, it's, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a social media update, uh, which I've started to do, uh, not just to, you know, tell everybody oh yeah i'm doing my miracle morning that's part of it trying to inspire people the other part is for me it's a massive accountability tool so by me having to post every single day that i've just done my miracle morning it gets me up and it gets me doing it and i and i and i, and, and I finish it off by posting my uh, miracle morning telling people about it it's trying to inspire people if i've got a thought of the day while i was running that came to mind i'll share it on on, on at that point uh, and that starts me off and then and at that by then uh, it's you know it's around about seven o'clock and, and and my day is going to start then where my kids wake up I take my kids to school um, get back home around about nine o'clock and then you know my real part of my da- day is in terms of my uh, property investment business mm-hmm. that's when I start doing that so you know it'll either be putting offers in going to see properties going to see refurbs being done uh, you know but by then I'm ready to go whereas before I would probably wake up at nine uh, seven o'clock wait with the kids, take them to school, running around straight away, not even have time to think, get home, nine o'clock, have breakfast, go to the gym at 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock, start doing some work, pick up the kids at, pick up the kids at three o'clock. I've, I've had two hours to do any work in my property business. Not, how, that, how am I going to do anything and make my property business work? I'm just spending two hours doing, doing that. You know, and that's, that's what I realised, you, you know, by doing every, all this stuff in the morning, it gets you going. And then it, when you get going, you're going. You're not, you're, not, you're not spending half your day just doing little, doing stuff that you shouldn't, shouldn't be really focusing on during the day. No, absolutely. I think, um, I think it's key also as well, um, especially like with social media and emails and stuff, that, that key part of the day that you've taken out for yourself, which, as we talked about earlier, it's really important to look after yourself in order to be able to look after other people. It's, it's yeah. done in a time where nobody's really going to be emailing you Nobody is able to take away your energy or control it. So, I I do a similar thing. Um, I'm not I, I, I shy away from the runs a little bit more than yourself. But I get myself, let's call it medication. I do the stuff for myself first. So I've kind of hit these small wins. So when the day does come and you're thrown with curveballs, as you probably know as a property investor, um, you're you're kind of more resilient towards it. Plus, if the day goes tits up shall we call it um you've still got so many things done like you've still done your run you've done your affirmation you've inspired people online you spent time with your daughters you've took them to school so you've still got a fair few wins if that makes sense so i think yeah it's fantastic yeah, yeah. yeah and like i say it's changed my life and, and like i say i have to do it now because 
I know I've spoke to you before about this, and and you know, so I only started my property journey in January 2017 and started doing this mindset stuff. Uh, but then, it kind of, I, it changed my whole life. I became a different person. Everybody around me is saying, "Oh, Gene, you've, you've changed. You, you, you know, you seem like really confident." You know, people people started coming to me and saying, you know, people that I used to look up to started coming to me and saying, Jim, you know, tell us about this book you're reading. Tell us about this. Uh, you know, how how have you become this different person? And I was and I was telling them, and I was like, you know, and I was inspiring people. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Absolutely. And for the first time ever, I could really say that I'd lost the anger, lost mm. the, you know, the way I felt about my past, and I let it all go totally. And and I forgave my dad and for everything that happened. I forgave myself, and more importantly, and I started moving on. Mm. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And then November time, uh, my sister got ill. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it, to begin with, it, we we no, we, it, we didn't think it was that bad. You know, they said it was arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which people uh, you know have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it kind of then it, we got told it's something called mixed tissue disease. Um, and then she just went in for a routine checkup uh, mid November, and she just kept they just kept her in hospital. Uh, I remember being on a property course that weekend and and getting back uh, off one of the days, and my brother in law called him at night saying, look, you know, sister's not well. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's, they're going to keep her in, and you know it's not, she's in the ICU unit, and it's just like crazy. Uh, I thought, what, what? I thought, I thought they just said it was, you know, uh, mixed tissue disease, and it goes a bit more serious than that, and they think it might be, you know, a rare, even rare, rare case of this. So I kind of, you know, I went there straight away, and I, and I stayed with her in hospital for two and a half weeks, and you know that that's another thing with like property and stuff that, you know, it allows you to do that. If I was doing my job, I wouldn't have been able to just go off mm. and do that. You know, and that's what passive income made, you know, makes me realise well, the importance that everybody's having some kind of passive income. Absolutely. But, but kind of going back to the story, you know, back to what happened, it's like, it just, it just, it just, like my whole life just changed. Uh, and, you know, we was having, I remember this, what uh, we've seen the consultants at one, at one, one of the points and he goes that we've never seen a case of this in the UK. Uh, there's only been a handful of cases of this in the world. Right. You know, we've got we've got nothing to refer to, uh, and you know, he said, it's, you know, it's it kind of didn't look good at all. But if you, you know, if if you heard what they're saying, you'd think that's it. But mm. I didn't. We never left. We never lost faith. You know, we kept on believing. You know, she's gonna make it. We knew, we knew, my tough, my sister was tough. Yeah. You know, she's the toughest person I ever knew. Um, and I thought, yeah, she's she, she'll fight this and she'll she'll get through this. And you know, at the beginning, she was, you know, we was, the first few days, you know, she was she was on a breathing machine, and the, the, we was told it was like she was doing a marathon every single day. Wow. That's how the pressure it was on her lungs, and she's just fighting it, and it's unbelievable. But it says she, we have, we have to put her in an induced coma. She can't keep doing this. Um, and then she put in a induced coma a few days later, and you know, she never woke up from that, and it's just like it's just a crazy time, you know, um, ups and you know, what points that we thought she was gonna be okay and at the points uh, you know you'd lost the news of your faith again like a lungs collapsed and stuff like that and you know i was i was able to be there from right from the beginning uh you know and i stayed there every single day i slept there at hospital talked to her i read books mm-hmm. to her you know i read a book uh the alchemist the first time while yeah. i was there and and it t- talked about you know purpose in life and stuff like that and, I, and then it kind of made me think and i said to her then i said look you know i said as a child that what you know that my purpose in life is to make sure that every child has the same opportunity in life that every child should have, and that's what I'm going to do. And we're going to can do that together. And you know, I thought she's going to make it. It's going to change her life, and we're all going to, you know, live our lives to the max. Because um, kind of just before she went into hospital, I was reading the five second rule, uh, and I said, like I said, a book always comes to me at the right points, and it said in there, she talked about a story of when her dad had a, a head a head tumor. And she didn't want to ask him directly, "How are you afraid?" Because she didn't want to ask him that question. But she, but then she thought, right, five, four, three, two, one, just ask yeah. him. And yeah. then I, when I went to my sister, t- t- it was two or three days before she went into uh, in, into the hospital. Uh, I sat there and she's sitting in a in a chair, and and I said, you know, I, just, I thought about it, and I thought, I'm going to say, it, I'm going to say, it. and then I said, five, four, three, two, one. And I went, are you afraid? And she goes, she goes, no, not really. She goes, you know, I, I, I know this is going to change my life, um, but I think I'll, I'm going to deal with it. She goes, uh, you know, 
I've, I've been working too hard and, 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 and I know that I'm going to, uh, from this, it's made me, I've had to sit down, it's made me stop and it's made me think about things in a lot more detail and she goes, I'm going to change my life now, I'm going to spend a lot more time with my family and focus on the things that really matter in life and, and I thought, yeah, maybe this is a blessing in disguise, it's like a wake up call for her mm-hmm. and I thought it's going to change her life completely and, you know, kind of, she never had that opportunity to do that and that, that was the hardest thing for me that she 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 knew what she wanted to do and how it changed her life and she never got to do that. I think that's kind of, that's one of the key things that changed me, saying that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in life. And, if, you know, ha- people always wait for, wait for this wake-up call as mm-hmm. such. You know, it's gone property courses and, and the, first, the person at the front of the front used to say to you, tell, tell about a story of their life mm-hmm. and it used to be about hardship and something the barber came. came. And how it changed your life. And I used to think, oh, they're, they're lucky in a way that this, they've had something happen in their life that's given them a wake-up call and they've got some new power that, that's transformed them as a person and made everything happen for them. But it doesn't happen like that. You know, I lost my sister and it, it didn't automatically transform me into this person that's had a wake-up call. It knocked me for six to six, for six to be basic, basically. I, I tried to deal with it. In a, in, by keeping busy first, and, and I just threw myself into my, my, my property and getting it finished and everything else, and I, I didn't give myself time to self grieve, to grieve and, and, and you know, to, to get over it. And then it wasn't until about April time, uh, this, uh, in 2018, that uh, my wife said, look, we need to get away and spend a bit of time together as a family ab- abroad. I go, okay, let's go. And so we went to Egypt, and I had a few drinks, and... I kind of got back to the room and I just I just crashed totally and all this anger just flew out and I was like God and I was just mm-hmm. shouting and everything why why have you done this to us why are you playing games with us mm-hmm. you know I had this hard life just as a point where my sister's happy we're all happy mum's you know I've settled down we've all, we've all got you know we're all married we've had kids mum's relaxed for the first time in her own life and in, in her life why are you playing games with us and why are you doing this and all this anger came out is all all you know, totally towards God and. You know, I came back and I just crashed. I, I started drinking. I, uh, I was watching the World Cup and for the first time, you know, I was drinking on myself and I've never done that in my life. And I just totally burnt all that stuff, you know, from just before we met, of, of having this book and changing my mindset and everything else all went out the window and I, and, and I, I was just back to a worse place than I'd ever been in my whole life. I was in a, in a dark hole. And I was angry at friends. I was angry at angry, everybody. I started becoming just an angry person. Uh, you know, I was, you know, the, I was angry at friends for not always asking me how I felt and how, about my sister. I was angry about, you know, people not totally understanding how I feel, and it just, I just started going out of control uh, and expecting from everybody to, to help me and get me out of this hole uh, that I was in, and expecting everybody to do something for me. And when they weren't able to, I was angry at them. And then I thought, then it came to a point where I said, look, Jin, you need to take control of your life. What did you do? at the beginning of this year to change you as a person as a person you need to go back to the basics and start doing that you know i can't you can't let your sister down so that's what i basically did and, and i kind of went back to the basics and i thought okay first of all i need to find a book find a book that helps you deal with grief and and it's, it's specific to me so i, I went out looked up looked on looked fan and i managed to find a book about how to deal with the loss of a sibling as an adult. Is that the exact title? Because I'm just conscious if anyone's gone through a similar situation to yourself. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's what it's called. Because there's many books uh, that talk about losing, when, when, as a child, losing somebody. But there's not many books as, as losing your sibling as an adult. Okay. And then the book, that, that, that is the title of the book. Mm-hmm. And I read through that and it helped me understand why I felt why, why I did. How the relationship between my and my sister is totally different to anybody. Mm-hmm. And how friends and everybody else wouldn't understand that. And that's why... You know, your sibling is the only person that, that knows you better than most people because they've seen you as a child growing up mm. and every stage of your life. And that is, a, is an amazing relationship that no, not many people understand. Understand. I call my friends brothers, mm. and I say it all the time. And, 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 and when I say my friends are my brothers, I, I really mean it. And, uh, you know, there was part of my sister's wedding. Yeah. My close friends, they were part of, my, you know, part of everything. I bring them around my house. I make them part of my family, and I do everything with them. But when they didn't feel the loss of my sister the way I felt it, I was angry at them. I said, "Well, she's your sister too. How, how come they're not? How come they're not mourning it's like I'm mourning?" And then it wasn't until I read this that I thought, "No, the relationship I had with my sister was different. Was 
was different, yeah, and, and it's special, and it's you know that that they, they obviously I'm going to feel that because they they didn't they weren't uh, they didn't grow up with my sister the way I did, and they didn't go through everything that me and my sister went through together. And I think that kind of opened my eyes really. That was the start, and then then I started thinking about more about God and my relationship with God a lot more. And then another thing, a light bulb came, and it said, and it was like, okay, all my life. I've said, God did this. God help me with that. God did this. God, you've got, I've had a hard life, so you owe me. Mm. You owe me. Because I've had a hard life, you need to make this happen for me, this happen for me, this happen for me. And and because I've done that, I've always gave control to God, an external force. And then something clicked in my mind that, Jin, you need to take control of yourself and your own life. Absolutely. And then I seen a Will Smith video, and Will Smith said, there's a, there's, there's a difference between fault and responsibility yeah and it just clicked that as it just clicked in my head again and i thought okay you know i i'm blaming everybody blaming my dad blaming everybody else everybody else yeah okay it wasn't my fault that everything's happened to me it was not my fault that i lost my sister not my fault that i lost my dad it's not my fault that what i said to my dad you know it happened but it is my responsibility to start control taking control of my life that is my responsibility that is, that, is, that is my you know that's something i need to do and that's what i started doing i started taking control of my life Started running again. Started doing my miracle morning again. I started writing a book uh, online. Another thing I've always thought is, I started seeing social media as a different tool, seeing it totally differently. As I thought, okay, it's this, it's this, it's a, this amazing accountability tool. And if I post my story online every single day, it'll make me do it. And I'm just I'm just writing my story. So I'll do my miracle morning. As soon as I finish the miracle morning, spend half an hour to an hour just writing one or two pages of my story, and I continue doing that. And then, you know, because it's something I always wanted to do. It's like I had all these dreams of things I want to do. I thought, I'm going to start doing them now. And I'm not going to start talking about them. I'm going to start doing them. So I, by before I know it, I, I'd written my book. You know, 40,000 words. Uh, Fantastic. And, you know, next year I'm going to uh, publish it. In 2019, I'm going to sit down again, put it into Brilliant. chapters. You know, and the book's going to be called The Wake Up Call because that, that, that's where it's been for me. You know, there's been lots of wake up calls in my life. And, you know, it's, it's going to have a bit of a twist to it because, you know, People always wake, wake for this wake up call. We're trying to tell you that you don't need the wake up call to change your life, and the wake up call does not net mean that you just change your life. My dad had lost his brother; that could have been his wake up call. But he's made that opposite effect to him. You know, turned his life upside down or even more so. You know, don't always rely on that wake up call to change your life. I think this was one of the main reasons I kind of wanted you on uh, the show as well, is because okay, you've had plenty of wake up calls. I'm, I'm sure people will un understand you've you've not had the easiest of lives. But I always, myself as well, I'm always trying to tell people, do not wait for something bad to happen. I, I, I tend to find that if there's a bad event or something happens in, say, for instance, a family, for example, then all of a sudden everyone's living a life of gratitude for the next week. And, you know, they're really yeah. grateful for the little things in life. But then very, very quickly, we kind of just get consumed back into like normal reality, I suppose, or like the rat race or whatever you want to call it. And we just forget. Yeah. And then um, yeah. priorities start changing. Whereas... I'm very conscious because similar to yourself, um, I mean, I, I can't say my life's the same as yours. We all have our own trials and tribulations, but I've always just tried to live with gratitude, even in the good and bad times. Um, and I suppose mm -hmm. it's come from reading and stuff, but your book sounds fantastic. I know I know you were doing something. I didn't know you had written 40,000 words, um, and I'm sure it's going to be a big hit, mate, because you're not just... You're not just doing a course or reading something and then writing a book about it like a lot of people out there do today. You've lived it. And one of the things which I think people will resonate with is, yes, you understand the whole aspect of controlling your life and taking responsibility and accountability because only you can do that. But you're also showing your vulnerabilities in that you had it under control. Then you went away. I think it was in April 2018 and you lost it again. Then you grasped yeah. it again. And it's almost like, you know the answers but then even even yourself with all the mindset and the reading and all the habits you still fall off a little bit and, and I suppose it'll get easier and I suppose sooner or later you will nail it down and you have less of these kind of falling off the wagon shall we call it moments but uh, it's inspiring it's um, it's something I'm sure a lot of people go through and a lot of people have that kind of is it the victim mentality as opposed to the victor whereas you you've got in yeah. somewhere in you I can feel this you don't want to let your sister down and I'm confident you're not letting her down, knowing the person that you are, seeing your transformation. I just want to add one more thing. I remember seeing your first Facebook Live videos and we were friends at the time and I used to watch it and I used to think, 
this isn't the gin I know. Like the gin I know, you know, when we sit together and we, we go out, you're fun, you're laughing, you're smiling. And there was almost like an element of hurt and anger, or it could just be that it was five o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> it was weird because I was like, people need to see the real gin. And it's only recently, and I'm very proud of you for this, because in the last two or three months, especially, you've kind of come out your shell and you're almost getting a bit of a following now, which is more than well-deserved because you've been through it. And one of the things I knew you always wanted to do 12, 24 months ago was to help people and just generally inspire people. And I think you having those in the background, I'd always keep them there. A bit like my first YouTube videos, I keep them there because I want people to know, look, listen, myself and Jin, for example, we were naturally shy, introverted people who didn't know what was going on. Almost looking around the world thinking, do we belong here? Uh, should we be telling people our story? Um, and this is one of the reasons I really wanted you to kind of tell your story because it's only going to expand. You're only going to inspire more people with it. So the question I was going to ask was about adversity. Adversity has been a massive part of your life with like your sister and your uncle and, and your dad. So I'm going to just kind of bypass that just ever so slightly. Um, but if you could just quickly just give it like one tip. So I know you used the book as an example, which really helped you overcome the grief aspect but if there's somebody going through something now or if somebody out there has a friend or family member who's going through it what would you recommend to them because I know I spoke to you briefly about this would you want people to come and speak to you about your sister or your father or would you prefer it was just kind of swept under the carpet like the elephant in the room yeah I think that's a good point really uh, because a lot of people uh, and I had people that didn't even speak to me at all about it you know they never said a word and for me that 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 was worse, uh, because you know it's always there. You know, people might think don't speak to them about it because I don't want to raise it or I don't want to hurt that person by bringing a memory back up. But you have to remember when you lose somebody, you never it's always always there. It never goes away. So you're not going to bring that memory back up. You're not going to hurt me in any way. It, you know it's there. It's not hasn't gone away. So by showing me and asking me how I feel, you just showing me that you you know that it's not gone away and and you you're interested in how I'm feeling and, 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 and what I'm thinking. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's useful because myself as well, I'm guilty of this myself, is that you kind of feel, should I bring it back up again? But I think you've hit the nail on the head there. This is a part of you now. Like your sister's loss is always going to be a part of something. And like you just said, you, you, it's a daily thing, isn't it? So I'd certainly urge people who are perhaps going through the same kind of emotions or seeing someone they're struggling with to kind of try and maybe take that advice on board. I'm not saying everyone's the same, but it would certainly help most people. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that, Jin. I just want to just move this over a little bit. What is your biggest fear? I know you're a father and, I, and I've seen your daughters. They're adorable. And you might say something about them, but I'm, I'm going to cheat here and you're not allowed to mention your wife or your two daughters. Mm. So what is your biggest fear? I think... I'm always, I've always been scared of heights. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get really nervous. You know, if I'm if I'm going to a certain height, uh, I'll, I'll like I said to my wife, and I don't think she's too happy about it. I said I'm really scared of heights. I'm gonna go and uh, do a parachute jump next year. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she goes, No, you're not doing it. And I go, I go if I do that, and that's one of the biggest scare, things I'm scared of. Then I won't get, I won't be scared of much else. So I'm still trying to persuade her, <laughs> but. Going, going a bit deeper, uh, you know, that, that's one thing. I think a lot of people are scared of heights and, and, and other included, things like that. But, yeah. yeah, but going a bit deeper, I think, uh, for me, I, I don't want to wake up, you know, one day when I'm, you know, 60, 70 years old and say, oh, I wish I did. Yeah. I wish I did this or I wish I did that. I wish I did this. I, that that would be the worst thing for me. Uh, so I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather wake up at that point and say, you know, I did this, but it didn't work or it did work. But you know, at least I tried. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather be in that position. And you know, I I want to be I want to be an inspiration to my you know. Like I said don't mention your wife and children as much, but you know, I want to inspire them as much as anybody else. And 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 I, I won't be much of an inspiration if I'm sitting there at 60, 70 years old saying, oh, I wish I did this, I wish I did that, but I didn't. And you know, I just want to I just want to end my life like that. Fantastic, great points. Okay, so there you've heard it. That is the buzzer, and this is the fun part of the show. So if you're still with us. Thank you. What I've got is a whole heap of questions that I'm going to run through for the next 60 seconds. And it's up to Jin to try and answer as many as possible. So Jin, are you ready? Ready. <laughs> Starting three, two, one. Okay, the ability to fly or be invisible? Invisible. Money or fame? Fame. Netflix or YouTube? <laughs> Netflix. Calling or texting? Texting. Coke or Pepsi? 
Step three. Would you rather know how you would die or when you would die? How? Christmas or birthdays? Birthdays. Tea or coffee? Tea. Summer or winter? Summer. Your favourite place in the whole wide world? Hong Kong. Speak all languages or be able to speak to animals? All languages. If you could abolish one thing in the world, what would it be? Poverty. Facebook or LinkedIn? Facebook. <laughs> would you be able to read minds or predict the future? Predict the future. Have you ever been in a fight? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> did you always win? Oh, oh always. <laughs> <laughs> That's 60 seconds. So uh, we are actually coming towards the end of the show now. There's so much more that I could speak to Jin about and hopefully I can get him back on the podcast just to kind of maybe delve a little bit more into the whole the adversity side because if you can take anything away from this podcast it's that whatever your current situation is whether it's worse or whether it's the same or slightly better than Jin's current circumstances is that there is light at the end of the tunnel and I think Jin shows that one through his accountability and moving forward in his actions but two he's now becoming a very successful property investor he's now attracting a lot of investors so we're definitely going to move it over to the final question so the final question I have today is if there was a book, and I know actually you're going to be creating your book next year, but let's just say there was a book written by somebody, let's call it your guardian angel, somebody looking over your shoulders, who's seen everything you've been through in life, and they've written a book about you. And let's say in 150 years time, science fails to save us all, and people are still reading books. What would the blurb of the book tell us about Jin Atwell? So I'd, I'd hope it would say something like this. I'd, I'd hope to say that Jin was a man that had much hardship in his life, uh, however, never never let life beat him down. He always got up and dusted himself off and kept moving forwards. He was an inspiration to us all that you only have two choices in life, really, to get knocked down and stay down or get up and keep going. He chose to keep going. And we're glad he did do that because he wasn't only a great husband, father, brother and son. He was also a great human being. He knew what his purpose was in life, and that was to help young children suffering from hardship have a better life. And he stuck to that, and he made many. He made that true for many children. He understood what his purpose was. It was bigger than him, so he couldn't stop going. Wow! I'll tell you what. If I seen that blurb, I'd certainly pick it up. And I just want to add to that. He was also a great friend as well. So, uh, and I yeah. say that for, truly from the heart. So. Thank you. There you have it, guys. That's an unbelievable story, one riddled with ups and downs, which is still being written. And I think that's the most exciting thing because Jin is still writing his story. And I hope many of you find that inspiring, enlightening. And I'm, and I'm sure Jim wouldn't mind. I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit. If you reached out to him, if you ever wanted to speak to him. So what I'm going to do is if you could just, Not at all. just for the viewers, if um, they want to reach out to you, where is the one best place to find you? Uh, just personal message me on Facebook uh, and like I say I'm definitely always happy to help if I can inspire somebody and help them in any way I can I'm, I'm there straight away fantastic there you go guys Jin Atwell find him over on Facebook thank you Jim for your time and as always people thanks for listening thank you Aaron and remember this podcast is absolutely free so all we ask in return is for you to share this with a friend and drop us a five star review over on iTunes have an awesome day